Hi and welcome, my name is Lawrence Baker and this video is going to be about HDR photography in camera and in Lightroom. Now the first 25 minutes will be quite dry because I'm going to be talking about bit depth, exposure bracketing, etc. And the Lightroom bit is extremely easy. So if you have no problems using Lightroom for HDR, you don't really have to go through with this. But I will tell you that if you want to turn out good HDR, you need to understand the basic concepts. So the first 25 minutes will be about that. And then we'll go into Lightroom. Now, the reason I like Lightroom for HDR, because it does the tone mapping for me. In other words, it, it's automatic and I'll come to tone mapping later. And what happens is it doesn't do an over the top image and doesn't give the ability to make an over the top image as well. It's really aimed at normal photographers, not photographers who want to create that kind of grunge HDR effect. So let's get started. Overview, HDR stands for High Dynamic Range. Processing in Lightroom is easy. The real work starts in camera. You need to understand the basics of bit depth, exposure and dynamic range to get the most out of your HDR image. Assumptions, you have a camera that can shoot in RAW. Your camera viewfinder or camera monitor can display shutter speed. Helpful, but not necessary, is a camera that can shoot in exposure bracketing. More of this later. Right, let's explain dynamic range. It's measured in candelas per square meter and is dimensionless. It uses a logarithmic scale and is best expressed as a ratio. From our point of view, we're going to stick to ratios. Dynamic range is based on luminance, not color, but on luminance. It can refer to a scene, camera or display or monitor, whatever you like to call it. So it's scene referred, camera referred or display referred. For us, scene is the most relevant as we need to capture the dynamic range of a scene, but we will always be limited by the camera's dynamic range and the final medium in which we choose to show our image, display or print. It's not unusual to have a scene with a dynamic range of 10,000 to 1 ratio, especially if shot indoors with a window casting light into the scene. So if you need to photograph that window and there's shade to the side of that window, that's a very high dynamic range. This is a luminance scale I knocked up in Photoshop. And basically on the left, starlight is 0 0.0001 candela per square meter. Indoors, average light indoors is one candela per square meter. And if you were to photograph the sun, which is not advisable, it's 10 to the power of eight candelas per square meter. Bit depth. Cameras can capture raw data in either 12, 14 or 16 bits or bit. Lightroom and other raw processing software programs convert 12-bit images to 14-bit images. Most of us have still got 12-bit sensors. Computers find it difficult to work with 12-bit images, hence the conversion. In fact, Lightroom in the develop module is working in 16-bit. A HDR image is a 32-bit floating point image. So theoretically, there's no limit to the amount of dynamic range it can show. But obviously, uh, the scene is where the dynamic range is. So you can't create more dynamic range uh, with a 32-bit image if it isn't already there. Bit depth and a bit more depth. Bit depth and dynamic range are separate concepts, but it helps to understand bit depth as bit depth is an indicator of what dynamic range is possible. To add confusion, bit depth can be expressed per pixel, per color channel in an RGB red, green and blue image or by overall image bit depth. There's a lot of confusion caused by some quoting per channel bit depth rather than per image bit depth or even per pixel bit depth. For instance, many will say it's an 8-bit image rather than a 24-bit image. What they mean is an 8-bit per channel image, which is really a 24-bit image. An 8-bit per channel image has 256 tones or colors per channel. So 256 times 256 times 256 equals 16.7 million colors. 
Overall, it's safer to quote bit depth per channel as the digital imaging world works this way, especially when using Adobe products. Bit depth is not dynamic range. Strictly bit depth and dynamic range are separate concepts because you can upgrade an image to a higher bit depth using Lightroom, but you are not increasing the image's dynamic range, i.e. you can take uh, a 14-bit image in a raw image inside of Lightroom and output it as a 16-bit uh, TIFF, but that's not increasing the dynamic range. It has the ability to show the dynamic range of a 16-bit image, but if you have captured it with a 12-bit camera, well, you know, you're not going to have a huge dynamic range. Most cameras shoot in 12-bit, which I mentioned before, and it's converted to 14-bit by Lightroom. So if your camera shoots a single image at 12 bits, you can turn it into a 16-bit TIFF, but it will not have the dynamic range of the same shot taken with a 16-bit camera. Right, it's just a little uh, table here. A 12-bit sensor uh, has a dynamic range or theoretical dynamic range of 4096 to 1. This will always be limited by noise. 14-bit sensors, and there are cameras out there with 14 bits, it's 16,384 to 1. Again, there will always be some noise. A 16-bit TIFF, as which we mentioned earlier, can show 65,356 to 1 ratio of dynamic range. As I said, that doesn't mean it has that dynamic range. Now, a 32-bit image, which is a HDR image, it's limitless. Of course, it all depends on the scene captured, as I said. Now, this is the exposure triangle. Uh, again, I'll knock this up in Photoshop. So it's always a trade-off. So if you're an aperture priority and you've set your aperture, well, the camera sets the speed. If then you play around with the ISO and it's not an auto, the camera uh, speed will, will change. So it's a relationship that sort of goes around the triangle, so to speak. It's very straightforward, but I think most of us understand this, but it's just seeing it in this triangular form is very good. So if you shoot in um, shutter priority and set the speed, then the aperture might change. But if you set the ISO, it might affect how the aperture changes. So it's quite complex, really, but quite straightforward when you look at it like that. What is a stop or an EV? An EV is an exposure value. It's the same as a stop. Exposure is the amount of light the sensor receives. Now, it's good to be definitive about these things because people talk about exposure, but really they're saying it's the amount of light that comes into the camera, end of. One stop equals one EV. Now, old school photographers talk in stops, but your modern digital camera will have EV mentioned in it somewhere. When you come to do exposure bracketing, it will be done in EVs. Increasing by one EV or stop doubles the amount of light hitting the camera sensor. Decreasing by one EV or stop halves the light hitting the sensor. Aperture is measured in f-stops going from f4 to f2.8, making the aperture wider, doubles the amount of light hitting the sensor going from f4 to f2.8, halves the amount of light hitting the sensors. So it's done to the power of two for each stop, really. You will have um, settings in between, like you, you don't necessarily have to go from F4 to F2.8, you might have F3 there. But that's the basic concept. How to control exposure? Well, if you're in manual mode, you have total control over exposure. You can ruin your shot quite easily if you don't know what you're doing. In aperture priority, you set the aperture, the camera sets the shutter speed, you can control the ISO. Dependent on the ISO you set, the shutter speed can change. The exposure triangle again. In shutter priority, you set the shutter speed and the camera sets the aperture. You can control ISO. Dependent on the ISO you set, the aperture can change. Automatic program mode. And if you don't know the difference between automatic and program mode, automatic is the camera doing the work completely. You have no control. Program mode allows you to move the aperture around or change the shutter speed. Um, so it's still automatic mode until you make a change. Please don't use these settings for HDR because the camera makes all the decisions. Must do's. 
Never use shutter priority as this could change your aperture, giving you a different depth of field between shots. Use manual focus. You might get away with autofocus, but there's a danger your fancy autofocus lens could change the focus between shots. Now, I've taken some shots today with my point and shoot Leica X1, which is only 12 megapixels, it's not the top of the range Leica, and it's autofocus. But you know, you, as I say, you can get away with it, but it's best to use manual focus. Use a tripod, but some cameras and lenses with stabilization could allow you to shoot handheld if the light is good and the shutter speed is fast. I'm gonna show you when we get to Lightroom that actually I've done some handheld shots and taken them or merged them to HDR and it's got rid of the ghosting really, really well. And I'll show you that later. This is the manual way of shooting a HDR shot. And many professional HDR people will use this method. In fact, they even use spot meters, but using aperture priority or use spot meter on your camera, or even a dedicated spot meter, and they are quite expensive to buy, set the ISO to the native ISO of your camera, which is usually ISO 100. Point your camera at the brightest point and note the shutter speed. Point your camera at the shadows and note the shutter speed. Taking the shutter speed for the highlights, multiply this number by four. I use an app on my phone for this or a cheat sheet to find the next shutter speed. Keep multiplying by four successively until you exceed the shutter speed of the shadows. A notepad helps here, obviously. Decide how many shots you need to capture the dynamic range. Again, a cheat sheet or phone app could help. For a normal outdoor scene, three shots at two EV apart will be enough. Now, I have never used the manual method, um, but I know it works. And um, people who are very, very fussy will have literally a spot meter and they will go around spot metering their scene. Now, spot meters not only measure reflected light like cameras, but they can measure the light falling on a subject. So they are quite useful in that respect. But for me personally, I don't want to mess around too much in the field. And the next method, exposure bracketing, is very, very simple and much easier to get your head around. Most of us will have cameras that are capable of shooting in exposure bracketing. It lies in the menu system of your camera. Put simply, you set the number of shots you want the amount of EV or exposure value you want between each shot. Exposure bracketing in a bit more detail here. The camera decides how it wants to alter the exposure value based upon the camera's mode, manual aperture priority, shutter priority, or program auto mode. And we're not going to use program auto mode. Whilst in bracketing mode, the first shot will be at the camera's choice. So we're trying to expose the, the scene perfectly. That's the camera being in automatic mode, so to speak. Um, the second will be underexposed by the EV you've set. The third will be overexposed by the EV you set. Some cameras do not follow this method, but most do. Although the way the camera changes exposure can change between different models, it normally follows this method. How exposure bracketing behaves. Well, it's about the modes that you're in. In aperture priority, the camera keeps the aperture constant and changes the shutter speed. And of course, if you played around with the ISO, that could affect the shutter speed. In shutter priority, the camera keeps the shutter speed constant and changes the aperture, a big no-no for HDR. In manual exposure mode, if auto ISO is set, then the camera changes the ISO. If the ISO is set to something fixed, like ISO 100, then the camera modifies the shutter speed. The manual mode we've covered already, as you've seen. So you've got to be careful here, and you must set your camera up to um, your native ISO, which is ISO 100. Shooting and exposure bracketing, the easy method. Aperture priority is the only way to shoot for HDR other than manual. Set your desired aperture. So if you want a great depth of field, you can go to F16, but I would say F8 is fine for most landscape shots. Set your ISO to 100 or whatever your camera's native ISO is. Then set multi-evaluative metering or wide metering 
set the exposure bracketing to three shots at two EV apart. So you're going to cover six stops of dynamic range. Then you just press the button. Now, some cameras will allow you to have a slight delay before it starts to shoot. And my camera does that. So I can set it for five seconds or two seconds so I don't get any camera shake. You could use a, a remote control shutter thing or whatever you use, but I just use that method and I've, I'm using a tripod. It's absolutely fine. There are other methods of doing this. You could, for instance, with a camera or spot metering, point at the subject in the middle of the dynamic range, lock the metering if your camera has that facility, and again, set exposure bracketing to three shots at two EV apart and take the shots. To be honest, it's a bit fiddly and I don't like that method, so I just mentioned it quickly. Exposure bracketing continued. The only problem with exposure bracketing is the automatic part does not take into account the actual dynamic range of the scene. So it could possibly exceed six stops of range, but it's unlikely. But you could make it brighter than it necessarily needs to be. So that's the one downside of it. The two shots or two stops EV above and below might be greater or less than the actual scene's dynamic range, as I mentioned. The bottom line is experiment. Maybe just one EV apart for three shots might be enough to capture the scene's dynamic range. So it doesn't make that kind of overly bright HDR effect, or almost like it's glowing. Experiment with different uh, EVs and stop values between shots. I would personally say that going above two EVs between three shots is the upper limit. Sometimes reducing the EV range can be very effective. So it doesn't give you that over the top effect. Now some cameras can shoot nine shots apart, etc. But basically keep it to six stops maximum between all three shots. Tone mapping, this is very important because no discussion about HDR can take place without mentioning tone mapping. But inside Lightroom, you don't have the ability to change tone mapping, and I'll come to that later. Your monitor and your eye cannot perceive all the dynamic range a 32-bit HDR image has to offer. So tone mapping is essential. Tone mapping takes the image and clips all the tones outside of what the monitor and human eye can perceive. In other words, it compresses the, the dynamic range or maps it to the range of the human eye, let's say, or a monitor. So it, it, that's what the mapping bit is. It says, well, that's the normal dynamic range the eye can perceive. And this is what most monitors show. So we're going to map it to those extremes of that monitor, let's say, so the brightest parts and the darkest parts. So it can be, you know, so it becomes better perceived by the human eye and your monitor. So really, your fantastic 32-bit image is actually on screen, not 32-bit, because your screen can't cope with it and nor can your eye. In Lightroom, tone mapping cannot be controlled by the user. And I often would tell you that actually having that control sometimes can ruin photographs and Lightroom is very subtle, so I do like it in that respect. In Photoshop and third-party plugins like Photomatix Pro, it can be controlled. Having this control is not always a good thing, as sometimes it can lead to that over-the-top HDR image, as I said. Although tone mapping is not controllable by the user in Lightroom, it's worth noting that tone mapping comes in two forms, global and local. Global is subtle. Local can lead to that grunge look. Local works on individual pixels, whilst global works on the overall image. And I believe that Lightroom's doing it globally, but I'm trying to find that out as a fact, but I can't at the moment because Lightroom don't give that information away. Or Adobe, as I should say. This is what I think about HDR. For me, it's a no-no for landscapes, but it can work if you don't have two wide um, stop values between your three images, let's say. No matter how subtle the effect, it, it looks unnatural to me. So I use it sometimes when I have to because the dynamic range was too much for my camera to cope with and I think HDR might work. It, let's say it's a rainy day with some very bright spots in the sky and some very dark bits in the hills, let's say. I might use HDR. As I said, there are exceptions. Only experimentation will deliver the results you want. Often, turning a HDR image, for instance, into a black and white image can be quite appealing. 
The human brain and I can perceive even the most subtle differences HDR creates that you in your exuberance might think a great masterpiece. We tend to think that no one will notice we shot an image, but they will. Getting your work critiqued by your family, friends or peers is a good starting point. Because when you first do HDR, you think, oh, that's really good, and put it out there on Flickr or 500px, and when you look at it three da years down the line, you think, oh my God, did I really create that? Right, that's it, really. We're going to go into Lightroom now. Um, Lightroom. Now, I've got a little collection set up here, but I'm actually going to go to the catalogue, and I'm actually I'm going to go to the folders and find a date. I don't want to pick the whole catalogue. Um, I think April the 3rd will do me. Now, if you've done something historically and you've shot with exposure bracketing, you can, you can use a method called photo stacking auto stat by capture time because you know there's only a, a small amount of time between the three shots normally. So let's say at two seconds, it's telling me I've got two stacks and 63 unstacked. So I can make a, a larger stack by going to three seconds. It's still two stacks. And I reckon as most of these shots are shot during the day, that will be fine, two stacks. So if I go stack now, I'd have to find them, but down here somewhere, I can't see them. There's one there. It's only got one of two there. Now that's probably a bad stack because um, there was probably, I was shooting with continuous shot there and got two shots close together. It's not a true indicator of what that image, uh, it's not the exposure bracketed image. So if I press E on the keyboard here to have that large view, you can see I've got my view set up like this. Now I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut, Command or Control J, and I'm going to show you that I've got exposure bias showing. So that's another good indicator beside, besides looking at the time. Now, if you sort by capture time and you've got exposure bias showing, you know then you can see the exposure bias at the top left hand side there. So you know that one shot's going to be 0 EV, usually the first shot, one's going to be 2 EV above, and one's going to be minus 2 EV. So that's quite useful to show. As I said, um, if you've shot nothing but exposure bracketing all day, it will be very straightforward to sort by capture time. Let's go back to my uh, collection that I had. Shut this down. Collections. Right, let's come out of that and go back to it. Pressing G on my keyboard, I can see that one in the corner is 0 TV, uh, 3 tenth of an EV, minus 3 tenth of an EV. So I've only got one stop between the three shots, and I did it deliberately because... I didn't think the dynamic range was there in that image. Now I shot this handheld. So I'm now going to go straight into merge to HDR because uh, I've already done lens corrections and we're not covering lens corrections here. So this this is three handheld shots. Admittedly, my camera had uh, image sta stabilization on. Not the lens, but the camera did. So let's select the three shots. Click on the first one. Click on the third one and shift click on the third one, I should say, and then go photo, photo merge, HDR, control H on a PC, control H on a Mac. Now we're going to see a preview here, and I want to show you about deghosting straight away. Now, if you shot with a tripod, you could probably get away with not uh, ticking auto align, but normally I leave it on. Now, if you look at that image, you can't see the ghosting, but what I'm going to show you now, I'm going to put it onto medium because there was definitely movement. There's dogs in the foreground and dogs do not keep still. So it's building the preview now. Right, it's built the preview. If I click on show de ghost overlay, you can see these two bits here. I've got quite a bit of movement, the dogs and the woman as well. So I'm going to have de-ghost on. I'm going to set it to medium. Auto align, well, that does its best as it's handheld to align everything. And I would say for shooting handheld, it's a definite. Even if you're shooting with a tripod, I recommend you have auto align on because it um, helps to stitch it together. Auto tone is the normal develop auto tone you have in a develop module. It's nothing to do with HDR. It's just Lightroom doing an auto tone that you would do in a develop module anyway. And I'll come to that in a minute. So let's merge it. It should appear in the collection. I'm absolutely certain it will do actually. So it's doing its work. The progress bar is going at the top left hand corner. 
So there's the HDR image. Let's press D on my keyboard to develop it. When it renders on my screen, you will see it in all its clarity. It's taking its time. Right, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Now, you could, if you look in the basic panel, it hasn't done anything to the white balance, but it's done an auto tone, and that's what auto tone is. Now, all I would probably do with this is stick the clarity up, probably go daylight for that. Uh, I want to do it quickly. I normally would play with the sliders. Press M on my keyboard to get the graduated filter up. Drag it down to darken the sky down. I've got a preset called uh, Standard Sky. Um, I don't normally use presets, but I'm going to use it on this occasion. When it renders, I'm going to close this down and say, well, that's not a bad shot. It's not over the top in any way at all. It's only one third of an EV between three shots, so one stop of light, because I don't believe the dynamic range was there. So you don't have to use two EV between three shots, because there's not many shadows, probably in the grass there, but am I interested in the shadows in the grass? Not really. And I think that's quite a pleasing effect. I've not even sharpened it or anything, so I could put the sharpening up a bit more, but you know, hey it looks okay now this is a 32-bit image on my screen so when you move the sliders in the in the develop module you're getting a little bit more control over the image and that's the great thing about working in higher bit depth so when you're in lightroom normally you're working at 16 bits now people say well the human eye can't perceive 16-bit images but for editing it gives you more control you're less likely to break up the integrity of your image when you're developing in 16-bit. Now, in Lightroom, it's automatic. You are developing in 16-bit. You are developing in the Profoto RGB color space as well. More of that in another video. So that's that done. Back to the grid, G on my keyboard. Let's find this one here because this was a real challenge. I'm gonna go E on my keyboard to go into loop view in the library module. Now, the first shot, his head's moved and I believe his hands move. So you can see his arm moving and his head. Third shot, um, not a lot's going on. Well, he's, yeah, not a lot, but basically he is moving about. So let's go back to the grid, G. Shift click on the third image. Keyboard shortcut, Control H. Get my preview up. I've got it already on medium because it remembers your last settings. So this will help us along the way a bit. There's the image, because of D ghost overlay on, all those red areas are where he's actually moved. Now I'm gonna leave it with medium because I believe it'll be all right. Merge. Now if I probably unticked auto align, it wouldn't be as good as this because auto align is about it trying to align the images up. Now, where it's got ghosting and stuff is being moved, it will actually remove it from the picture or take one of the pictures and say, well, we'll leave his arm there. And it does some fancy work to make it look normal. So there's the image. I'm just gonna press E on my keyboard now. I'm not gonna go into the develop module. Um, I probably would for this. It's still rendering on my screen at the moment, it's loading. I would probably play around that quite a bit because it's a bit bright, but can you see any ghosting on that image? It's really, really good. Even zooming in, I can't see anything. It's amazing, really. So let's move that back up there. Let's go back to the grid a sec. This is one I shot with my tripod. Now I shot it indoors with a little, um, very low wattage light on. Now, this is where HDR really works. For stuff like real estate photography, it is fantastic because if you need to brighten up a scene, I can't make that scene any brighter without using a flash. And again, that might give it a harsh effect. So I would probably use HDR if I was a real estate photographer or I was doing architecture because HDR seems to work very well on strong lines of man-made objects. And I would experiment shooting cars and buildings and trains because it can be quite effective. But for landscapes, I don't like using it and I would probably only use one stop between three shots. Now, the way I actually prefer to do things is I take the exposures into Photoshop and I play around with layer masks. Um, and that's for another video. And that's the way I get my effect. It's almost like uh, using a graduated filter inside of Lightroom or using one on your lens, let's say. I play around in Photoshop a lot. It is a lot of work, 
But if I was being fussy, this is the way I would do it. I would go away from the HDR look, shoot in exposure bracketing, which I always do, by the way, because I know then I'll get one shot that's going to be pretty good. And if I need to go into Photoshop and play around with layer masks and blending modes, I can. So let's get going with this. If I selected three images, I haven't yet. Shift click on the third one. Control or com uh, Control H, not Command. Even on a Mac, it's Control. Generating the preview. I really don't need deghosting on here. I'm going to turn deghosting off because it's not necessary. Now, as I shot it with a tripod, probably auto align is not necessary. If I turn it off, I don't honestly think I have a problem. Now, I haven't got a problem. To save it trying to calculate something that's not moved, you could untick it. Auto tone, as I said, is about the develop module. Don't worry too much about it. Let's merge this and compare it to the middle exposure, what my camera took it at, what it likes to take it at, which is zero EV. Now, there's it on the screen. I'm not going to play around with it in the develop module. It's too large at the moment, so I'm going to zoom down by going Command on my Mac or Control on the PC and minus. So there's that image. Now, to compare it to the one my camera would have shot, normally, it, that's the zero EV one. Look at that. That's amazing difference. So it's done a really nice job. Uh, I can do compare if I wanted to. Um, um, let's do it actually. So I, um, yeah, I'll do a compare on it. Um, zero EV, I believe it's N, there you are. That's the two images uh, side by side. Look at the difference. That is amazing. So HDR can be relevant for some types of photography, especially indoors. I don't run it down too much. I don't like the grunge effect. And to be honest, when I'm shooting landscapes, I'd rather use Photoshop and layer masks, etc. And I'm going to do another video on that. So that's it, really, guys. It, it's very straightforward in Lightroom. As I said, just to recap, the automatic uh, tone you see in the box is not tone mapping. Tone mapping is being done by Lightroom. If you go into Photoshop and merge it in Photoshop, which you can do. Let's go to the develop module again. If I go photo, edit in merge to HDR Pro in Photoshop, I'll have far more control over the image, over the gamma and tone mapping, etc. But here, it's done for me, so it's quite subtle, and I think Lightroom have done it deliberately not to allow you to ruin your photographs if you don't know anything about HDR. So it is quite useful. Um, as I said, the other things to watch out for really are use your tripod if you can. Exposure bracketing is far easier to use than the manual method. Three shots, two EV apart is the norm, but don't feel constrained to that. Maybe one uh, EV apart will be fine, or maybe a third of an EV, which is one stop overall. A stop equals an EV, so when you look at your camera settings, an EV is a stop. I hope you got something from this, guys. It is a pretty dry um, video. I'm really apologised for that. But, you know, to understand how Lightroom is working, you need to understand bit depth and the concepts. And I hope you've got something from it. Thanks very much.